This is TV Black Box, bringing you the inside goss from the TV industry. Hello and welcome to a brand new season of TV Black Box. Yes, we took an unplanned two-week break when we realised we actually all had Easter plans. But we're back and we're ready to rumble. I'm Rob McKnight. You can find me at Rob underscore McKnight on social media. And I'm joined by actress Sarah Monaghan, who you can find at Shrimp Tank. Hello, Sarah. Guten Tag. Indeed. Did you have a good Easter? Oh, yeah, it was pretty good. I actually, I got a brand new job, so I worked most of it, Um, but I had it yesterday off. Fabulous. Well, it's good to have you here. And we also have the viewers advocate, Steve Malk, who you can follow by searching for Malk's TV Talk. Mate, you've had a bit of a rough day, haven't you? Look, I have, and I want it on record, I didn't have any Easter plans. I was happy (laughs) to keep doing the podcast. Everyone left me. (laughs) That's true. That's very true. And we didn't we didn't we didn't feel safe leaving it in your capable hands because we thought you'd show us all up. How amazing would it have been? <laughs> you ranting for an hour? No, just no <laughs> subscribers by the end of it. <laughs> but uh, you had an accident today. Yeah, I it's been a bit rainy uh, up here in Queensland for the last few days and uh, I was it was a low speed accident which is the worst part, but I just I was riding on my motorcycle, leaving a friend's place like 20 metres away and went to go around a speed bump. They live on a, a shared property and the the dirt on the side of the road, the verge, I guess you'd call it, was really, really water laden and it didn't look like it. And my bike just slid out from under me Ow. and I landed on the road uh, and my helmet now has some pretty sizable gouges in it where my head dragged me along wow. the road and uh, I've got to get some things fixed on my bike. Yeah. But at least your head's okay. Um, yeah, look, that's prob- that is the only thing that's intact. My pride is not. It's an easy thing to happen. I was following a mate home from work one day many, many years ago. He was on his motorbike and I was mm. following in the car. And the road was slippery. And as we yep. turned a corner, he fell over in front of me. And I hit the brakes and was literally going to hit him and just had to turn the wheel and ended up doing a 180 and completely was facing the wrong way traffic mm. and only just missed him by centimetres. Uh, it was very, very scary. It's um, yeah. So good luck to all the <laughs> motorbike riders out there on the roads. Be safe. Stay upright, friends. Indeed. Now, for those of you who have been asking, we appreciate it too. Dan Bennett has been dealing with a protracted illness, but he will be back when he's fit and healthy again. I spoke to him today. Uh We hope that won't be too far away. We're sending all our love. He will explain exactly what's going on uh, when he gets back, but uh, he is okay. He is still part of the team, and we look forward to seeing him again soon. Dan has been growing a third leg. (laughs) Well, that'll make for an interesting podcast. (laughs) Okay, let's get to the news. An actor, Samuel Johnson, has dropped a bombshell about the voting process for Channel 10's Dancing with the Stars. Johnson pleaded with his Facebook followers not to vote for him because the money from votes doesn't actually go to charity. Instead, Johnson set up a donation button for his followers to pay the 55 cents directly to cancer research. The news came as a surprise to many viewers, myself included, who thought a portion of the vote money went to the celebrity's chosen charity. 10 clarified the process with TV Tonight, saying the winner of Dancing with the Stars receives $50,000 for their chosen charity. Mo, do you think there are any viewers who thought only the winner's charity would get some dough? Well, no. I think that... Because the thing that we are all primed and bled into now is that when you... Because there's two ways to vote. You can vote online, free, or you can vote via the, you know, the 1902 number process, which costs you 55 cents a call. And I think we've all been primed to expect that every number, every time you call, that money goes towards and builds up like a bank towards a charitable donation, whether it's each week the person that goes or, you know, your Which is certainly the case with I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Well, we had that controversy at the start of the year, if you remember, where um, there was uh, an assertion that the money didn't go or it was something, something, and they made a mm. very big point that after costs, you know, blah, 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 sort of played through. Um, what is clear in this is that you can vote as many times as you want to each week, but the money each week kind of just goes into a massive kitty and the winner gets $50,000 for the charity. But if you're a Samuel Johnson fan and you're voting for him, you would be expecting your money to be going to his charity, not if someone else takes out the ultimate prize. Oh, 800%. You would you would be thinking that I'm voting for Sam, I'm voting for Love Your Sister or any of the other um, yep. dancers and their charities. So 
Look, it's all very, it's hidden away in the fine print. That's all it is. But considering the stars are talking about their charities and talking the whole yes. thing up, this is why they're doing it. Yes. And you can tell Samuel, to me, it seems like... He found out late in the game yes. that the money wasn't going, which led to this post. Oh, now, look, I would put it down to maybe Samuel worked it out late in the game. I don't right. know that Samuel got told late in the game. Um, God bless Samuel Johnson. He's a great guy, but he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, he, it might have been, and I, look, I would suppose, full, full credit to 10 or the producers of dancing, I'm sure somebody explained it to them. Either Sam didn't turn up or oh, He Sam might have simply asked up. the question of someone, how much money has my charity received so far? It Look, might have been as simple as that. And when he found out yep. nothing, because it doesn't happen until the end, yep. that post obviously came from a realisation from his point. And, of course, that's ten, sent 10 into a tailspin and they yes. would not have been happy. And he's then had to do subsequent posts, Sarah, saying that, you know, oh, please vote for me. I'm still in it to win it. It gets... Um, I think he said something along the lines of it's good publicity for the charity. So, you know, like he's obviously been given a, a, a thorough talking to by 10. Yeah, my thing is, is like I'm a celebrity does make a huge deal about even if you get knocked out early that all of the votings till then have been mm. given you money. So I would have assumed the same thing. But now I'm like, why would I pay 50 cents a vote when I could just get on Twitter and do it for free? Because it's, I guess it's. That's true, but it's also part of taking part and you feel like you're giving to charity and you feel like you're doing the right thing and there's a presumption of that. And, and look, 10 may have not actually done anything wrong here and have been very clear in their terms mm. and conditions, yes. but the way the whole thread of the storylines with the celebrity charities and everything runs through the program, there is an assumption from the viewers and whether that's fair or not, you know, like legally, tenor are probably in very safe water, but I think it leaves a sour taste in the mouth. But I will they all don't... but guarantee you that, sorry, Sarah, I will all but guarantee you tenor in um, fine legal waters because they have said all of the things correctly. Yep. They haven't once suggested that each week money goes to whatever. Yep. Sorry, Sarah. No, no, but then it's like, so they don't have 50 grand set up to start with to pay whoever wins, they accumulate that through the whole thing? No, I don't I don't think the two are being drawn together. I think they're just saying there's fifty grand on the table for yes. the charity and of the winner the celebrity who wins. All of the contestants are being paid to participate. Like let's Oh not, yeah, they're all making their like money. Like they're all getting their monies and their managers are getting their monies and they're doing it for their charity to win fifty grand. Whoever no, wins. They're doing it for the money. <laughs> the charity is a secondary cause. It makes you, oh, look you know, I like, would put except for Samuel. Because obviously, as we all know, and the reason this has come up is because yeah. his charity for his sister is very, very close to him. What you find in a lot of these cases is the celebrity does the deal to take part in one of these reality shows and then actually has to go and find a charity that they to support, you know. And there's a lot of thinking that actually goes along in whether it works perceptually for them to be part of this charity or that yep. charity. There's actually a lot of thought process that goes into it. And if I'm with this charity, will that help me get more votes because that charity will get behind me? Well, it's yep. like my publicist had put me up for a couple of those shows and there was a lot of discussion about do I do one that has to do with child sexual assault or mm. am I supposed to now move away from that and pick another charity yep. so I'm not constantly mm. associated with it? So, yeah, it is very controversial. Animals which are always safe, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but the, that is some of the consideration because it's about the perception and what you want to um, be going forward. You've often talked about the fact that you face a dilemma with who you are, forgive me for using this term, as a brand, because you, you know, you have been seen in this sexual harassment area. But how do you, Sarah, go on as a person and how are you seen differently by the Australian public after going through that whole trauma? Yeah, and it's like, do I, do I continue to support something that's very close to me or do I try and change the brand and branch out and stop being just that? And so there is that conundrum. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll see you on one of those reality shows soon. I am available. <laughs> I'd love to see you, Sarah. I would love to see you in those reality shows and uh, I would actually vote. I would pay the money to vote for you even though I know Aww. your charity is not getting a cent. Oh, Thanks, wow. Rob. 
Channel 7 executives must be worried with headlines proclaiming evening game show that Chase has suspended production while host Andrew O'Keefe takes time off to deal with a long-term health crisis, according to the Sunday Telegraph. The news comes as the game show continues to dominate the time slot with the 5.30 coded section beating every single Channel 10 show in week 15, which was the last week of official ratings before the Easter break. I'm going to make that point again. The Chase, a show that airs at 5.30pm, beat every single show on Channel 10. Every single show. TV Blackbox reached out to Channel 7 to confirm whether the current production break was planned, but the network refused to comment. Sarah, Andrew does such a great job hosting this show. It's rough when your personal issues play out in public, isn't it? Especially when your show is going gangbusters. This is a no-win situation for him or for Seven. Yeah, it's got to suck. You finally got a winner and then, like, you've got to take time Mm. off. Um, Mm. I, yeah. Is he okay though? Look, I, I hope so. And I actually am very fond of Andrew. I, uh, I know him and actually got in trouble from him one time. Um, we, we were at the Walkley Awards and, uh, and he knew a friend of mine and he came up to talk to that friend. And then I turned to him and said, hello, Andrew, I'm Rob. And he looked at me and goes, I know who the fuck you are. Why would you introduce yourself? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to offend. He said, Rob, what kind of guy do you think I am? We've worked together. We know each other. Why would you think I don't know you? And I said to him, Andrew, don't let my insecurities affect how you feel about yourself. I just assume nobody knows who I am, okay? And we actually had this hilarious argument at the Walkleys about who should feel more put out by this conversation. <laughs> he is a fabulous bloke. And I, I tell that story just as a way of showing what a great guy he is you know like he knows people he he's he's such a good guy um he's we've been at the same hotel one time and he you know the the seven had organized for him to get his car and i was about to catch a taxi he's like no you get in with me rob you know like and that's why he was offended that i i assumed he didn't know who i was but he's a great guy and i wish him nothing but the best there's there's not a lot of great people in this industry but he's a great great person and has shown Everyone that I've I've known, nothing but love and respect, and is a, is a really nice bloke. So I hope he gets whatever's going on in his life. I hope he gets through it, and I just wish him all the very best. Uh, well, hopefully, I guess they keep the show waiting for him because I mean it would be better to wait than yeah. to have someone else take over, right? I don't know who could do it, and and what they've done is they have um, they're running repeats over Easter, so that gives them two weeks, and I think they're far enough ahead yes. that they can go on a bit of a production hiatus for the moment. Well, there's also the PR issues of if the as is usually the case, if the episode doesn't go to air, the people who won don't get anything. But there's no the, – the, the episodes will get to air and, and I don't sure. think that'll be an issue. Oh, no, no, uh, I acknowledge that. But, yeah, yeah, there can be those problems where sometimes if they hold episodes back mm. – like, for example, if you're expecting your episode to air in the last two weeks and they went, oh, actually, we've put repeats on and we'll run you in, in season. Yes, uh, that's absolutely true because you don't get paid until the episodes yeah, go to air. That's, check? Yeah, that's absolutely true. We're talking ratings and unfortunately things are going from bad to worse for Channel 9's beleaguered Today show. While we've been on a break, not only has ABC News Breakfast beaten Georgie Gardner and Deb Knight in the five city metros, which I always said would be a huge thing, but Seven's The Morning Show has also beaten it. On Good Friday, the Larry Ender and Kylie Gillies advertorial show had 207,000 viewers to today's lowly 176,000. On Thursday, 11 of April, the day PM Scott Morrison caught an election, ABC News Breakfast had 181,000, beating Channel 9's breakfast show, which delivered 178,000. Look, Nine has come out and disputed the win because ABC simulcasts their breakfast show on ABC 24, which contributes to their numbers. But as I explained on tvblackbox.com.au, that argument doesn't stack up because Nine has done exactly the same thing in 2014 when they roadblocked the block glass house on Nine, Gem and Go. We've seen 10 do it with Family Feud. And as far as I'm concerned, ABC are the only ones who do a true simulcast because they air it at exactly the same time. Nationally. If you're in Perth... 
you can watch it live while yes. it's airing in Sydney and Melbourne. No other network who does a simulcast does that. They do a delayed broadcast as well. So as far as I'm concerned, ABC do the true definition of a simulcast, allowing viewers choice. And yes. I we are now, TV Black Box is now the judge and jury of all network disputes. Oh, shit, so I can't handle this. We are now, if there's ever a dispute between 7 and 9 or 7 and 10, 9 and 10, 9 and 7... We are deciding the outcome, and Judge Rob has ruled in the ABC's favour. They are a legitimate winner. Just like in 2016, I also rule in favour that, that the Today Show won that ratings year, no matter what Seven, no matter what Sunrise say. Mm. That was today's year. But we're not in 2016 now. Today's in trouble, Mog. It, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. They can't have it both ways. Today is in big trouble, isn't it? Look, it sure is. We'll have to call you uh, Judge Rudy. <laughs> I think that's how that works. Um, uh, the, the, the challenge in the midst of this is that, I mean, Nine regularly broadcast the NRL on both their primary channel uh, in NRL markets, and they have in the past. I can't, look, I I used to follow sport a lot, and now I'm, I've been very slack the past few years because I just haven't cared. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if they still run it on gem or whatever uh, in non NRL markets when they did, I can guarantee you because it was simulcast, it was live in those markets at those times. They add the numbers up. Absolutely. State of origin. When they air it, it goes live. It goes live into Perth. They add those numbers in. We see press releases these days talking about the fact that uh, it aired here, you know, it aired on 7, Cricket aired on 7, Foxtel, uh, streaming, you know, like they add all those figures up when touting numbers. Oh, the mate, ABC, they'll, they'll take everything. Every, a- even absolutely. If aren't, like, and even and if Nine made the point, more. though, that we don't include Nine now. Yeah, but that's not comparing apples with apples. The ABC are broadcasting on two channels, and as I said, a true simulcast, those figures stand, but that's not even the issue here. Today no. got beaten by the morning show. That look, should not happen. And someone on Media Spy said, so what? They're in different time slots. That's exactly the point. A later morning show should not be beating a breakfast show. That's a real issue. And, you know, I, I, I genuinely don't think that this can continue. And I know Nine have to. That Nine have put all their chips behind this team, and I. Yes. They're going to have to see it through until the end of the year. I get that, but Jesus, how many more bad headlines can they take with this show? It is not working. You need to. They need to go back to the drawing board. They need yes. to take it all off. They need to reformat the rundown, and they need to look at what they're doing with the show. What can we do differently? And I tell you, there's so much they can do differently, but they need to scrap everything that they're doing now and try again because they got it wrong. Story three, 20 minutes in, and Rob is fired up. I'm um, fired up, baby. It's fired been up. two weeks of not being able to have my rants. I'd wait until I get into it later in the in this show. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I look forward to it. The, the challenge is this. Full credit to Nine and and the executives who are responsible for Today Show and News for backing them. Well oh, done. Oh, completely. And by the way, I get fired up because I care. Yeah. You know, like I actually want the show to be successful. And there's a lot of people I know on that show who I admire, respect and really like. These podcast episodes would be a lot shorter if we didn't care. Correct. And 10 would have a lot less to bitch about if we didn't care. <laughs> um, the, the challenge for poor old today is that Look, if you take into account, as I have been, looking at the ratings every weekday morning for the past, since the relaunch in January. It's depressing. The trend line is still going down. Yeah. It's still moving away from Sunrise, whose trend line is going up. On average, it's 60 to 70 to 80 to 100k difference of a morning. Sunrise being number one is no longer the story. That's just a given now. It's not even... Uh, Michael Pell complains, he's there saying, but we're number one, we're number one. And everyone's like, yeah, but we know that. The more interesting story here is the fact today's going down even further. So it's just a guaranteed fact now that Sunrise is number one. That's a hell of a position to be in. If you were David Kosh or Samantha Armitage, you'd be going, oh, thank God. Like, honestly, they've had the best part of, you know, 12 months to 18 months of just press-free, everything is great. At this point... To, to not be too indelicate, um, Sam Armitage could date Koshy and no one would care. <laughs> you know, like, 
David's happily married and Samantha's, I think she's got a partner, but they, they could hook up live on air. <laughs> no one would care. Well, I don't quite know about that, but is that why we've why breakfast TV is no longer creative? You know, like I feel like there's no creativity in, in breakfast television. Where are the days when they used to go up, fly tradies up on a plane to fix houses in cyclone-ravaged areas? You know, like mm-hmm. the, breakfast TV used to shape the narrative of the nation and used to be so important to us, and it just isn't anymore. Because... And- there's jerks like us who are analysing their every move. And look, we're being generous. We're, we want them to succeed. There are people who are just in it for either articles or, you know, columns in their paper or, mm-hmm. you know, columns on the Media Spy um, website that, that just want to hack off and, and land their, their, you know, backstabbing ways in them because that's you've had they've had to play it safer. They've had to be a little bit less Yeah, less but as a challenger, as number two... You shouldn't be playing it safe, and that's what no, got I Sunrise hear. into the position it is in now. Because in the, in the early days when Adam Boland was running it, it was not safe. They just went, "We have got nothing to lose here," and they changed Breakfast TV. The problem is today is a carbon copy of Sunrise, and I know you can argue they can come back to me and say, "Well, we do seven to seven thirty differently." Yes, I know Sunrise does its news section first, and then its interviews, whereas today it goes straight with the I interviews. I know one significant person who's the executive producer who will argue with you. He, there's no. He, he has said publicly on the record that the sunrise of today is just a millennia different to what it was under Boland's regime. I disagree with that. I, I and, think, and I hear you. I'm I, just I think saying there's that obviously know... been some evolution, as there should be, but I think the format that Boland set in is still pretty much at play. Entertainment's still mm-hmm. at seven forty. You know, like you look at the seven to eight o'clock hour. You know, at seven o'clock we get news headlines with the newsreader. Then we get the in-depth interviews with. Um, I was about to say Mel and Koshy, but Sam and Koshy. And then you know, like, and then at seven forty you've still got your entertainment section. Then an interview at seven fifty, and then you're back into news at eight o'clock. Um, no, that format hasn't really changed. There's been adjustments, of course, but. I, I I think it's pretty much still the show Boland put in place. And the problem is today should be doing something completely different. If they were going to do the big new relaunch that they promised us on January 14, it should have been something completely different and it wasn't. And let's be honest, and I, I'm just sick of I, – I, I don't – care anymore i just think it needs to be said it's a fizzer you know and i respect the people there but sometimes you get all these great people together and it doesn't work and it is not working and you know nine can bury their heads in the sand and pretend that all is good but the fact is they have got a dud and what are they going to do to get this themselves out of this hole we'll we'll have to pull this beast apart at a later stage because i'm i'm not i'm not convinced that it's the entirely or wholly the 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 on-screen team. I haven't said that. Oh no, no, I no, hear you haven't said that. But I think in in piecing it apart, the first response by most people, not you and and not me, is to say, well, there's a problem with the on-screen team. I think that there's some stuff there that we can work on. But I think that broadly, the way that the Today Show lands itself is a, a poorer carbon copy of Sunrise, who are yeah. leading. And when you copy the leader, all you're going to get is a copy, What's your and point it's of not going to be good enough. Even your yeah. graphics look like Sunrise. I turn on and I get confused what show I'm watching because it's all the same colour scheme. You know, they used to have two distinct identities. At the moment, Sunrise is uh, t- at the moment today is just trying to be Sunrise. Well, and both of them, both of them just look like the carbon copies of American morning shows. Um, but I think that we should which just, is true, one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean they're yeah. just totally ripping off like the Today Show in the US and the other shows. But I think we should make it interesting and put out a calendar and start uh, circling when we think that uh, Studio Ten will beat them. No, Studio Ten. You don't think they'll ever still... get there? Jesus. Um, there was a time when maybe, but no, not even then. Um, <laughs> Studio 10 is down it was 49% on where it was in 2017. Um, it, look, the new executive producer, Tamara, I think is actually doing a really good job. And someone on Studio 10 said to me, I've still got PTSD from in between when you left and Tamara started because it was a really shit time for everyone working on that show. Yeah. Um, Tamara, I think, and I don't know Tamara, but it sounds to me like she has come in, she's getting a handle on the show, um, and 
I said I've said publicly I think the show is getting its mojo back ratings wise it's still sitting at around 50,000 at the same time 2 years ago it was sitting at 80 90 100,000 you know there would be days where we'd have the old chicken and chips we always had this thing where we did chicken and chips if we got over 100,000 um I can guarantee you they're not getting chicken and chips these days but um I think the show ratings wise is in a real problem area because it it lost the viewers who loved it and it's got a long way to go to get back to that yeah we're we're in we're in some pretty diabolical position like i hear you sarah but it's in the today show is in the toilet if studio 10 is beating it right now acknowledging where both of those shows are i think i think today it can be summed up in no better way for today uh, when we look at the fact that they just did their big ob in queensland to try and sort of lift the whole game there and get involved in that Stevie was out on the road with his kids. Um, and, and that's awesome. What a great way to include someone who's a working father that has to, you know, incorporate and do all that sort of stuff. There was no discernible lift in today's ratings by them travelling to Queensland. No, and, and, and travelling can help, but if your core product is no good, you, you've got some issues. Yes. Meanwhile, Australia's commercial free-to-air TV networks are furious. The federal government has announced an extension of production incentives to online streaming platforms such as Netflix, Dan and Amazon. The incentive, according to The Hollywood Reporter, is aimed at boosting the local production sector by giving online productions the ability to claim refundable tax offsets if they meet the other eligibility requirements. While considering the move does not impose any content quotas on these companies, receiving a benefit from the incentive, are the free-to-air broadcasters right to be upset about the move? Oh, look, I don't, yes, they are right in that their competitors are getting opportunities that they're not. But it is creating jobs in Australia. Australian post-production places are doing um, uh, special effects work for many big TV shows and some films. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is creating jobs at post-production houses. And let's let's not forget, television networks um, uh, got their licence fee revoked. They didn't have to pay that. Uh, and that still may be the case, I think. How long are their memories? That's right. They don't have mm. to pay anymore. But the free-to-air networks would say... That's all true, but we have quotas in place. Yes. We, we come into Australian homes. We've got quotas in place that we have to provide X amount of drama per year, and yep. these streaming platforms don't have to do that. And I do think there's an argument to be made for a company like Netflix to have to have drama quota points. We were having, I was having this conversation actually on, on Twitter this afternoon with some people. Um, hello to David and to, to Mark. Uh, and others that were involved in that conversation. And I, uh, even though it was a like a really good, solid, robust conversation, I think I'm still in no better place to say what the options are to include, to either induce slash enforce a Netflix or an Amazon. Stan are an Australian company and those sorts of things. And I acknowledge being overseas companies operating in Australia, you need to play by Australian rules. I get that. Um, however, we have never seen a situation where an overseas media company has a footprint in Australia unrelated to either subscription or free-to-air television that we would have to impose quotas on them. Because I look at it from Netflix's perspective and go, the Australian market is worth X much to us. If you impose overly restrictive quotas or, or content I'm not saying overly whatever, restrictive. Start no, no, with 13 you're hours. Not. Do one season of one show. You know, put well, they, 13 they hours up. Well, then they, they meet are. it, don't they? Yeah, but that's the thing. There are no quotas and there are no content rules. But they're not getting paid like a blanket amount. They're only getting paid per production, right? Mm-hmm. For the, the so, quota content, or the, the incentive stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think, it, and it's by application, which, of course, because you're doing. In the States, the big thing, the big issue is... Um, different states offer different tax incentives for people to come to their state. Mm-hmm. So Hollywood now no longer makes Film as much Georgia, man. Mu- yeah, it's all in Georgia. And yeah. there used to be a lot in Florida where I live, um, but Florida got rid of the tax incentives. Yes. So everybody left. So every election now, because, uh, you know, it's election season, um, yeah. there's all of the people who are touting to bring back the tax incentives because things like Bloodline, which was filmed in the Keys, brought literally tens of millions of dollars in tourist revenue yeah, yeah. to Florida. 
And so they're like, uh, they're starting to get a few new productions here again. But they talk about how much money is infused into a place mm. because of these productions. So if they're not getting like, they're not saying to Netflix, look, we'll give you $10 million a year to make production, no matter how much. But hey, if you do make something, we will give you a tax offset, which gives you a little bit of a, a something, something to come here. And then, sure, the free-to-air networks don't like it, but all the actors have got to love it, all the freelance yeah, people have got yeah. to love it because now there's an incentive for actual production to be in Australia, which is fantastic because people <laughs> can get The government could always bring back, uh, what was it, 28C or whatever in the 80s. Basically, if you spent any money making Australian films, you got all that money back in tax. Uh, it, was a, it was a tax yeah, write-off. Yeah, yeah. And Huge it tax led dodge. to a lot of dodgy... Yeah, yeah, Australian yeah. productions, but there were also there was also some gold in there. So uh, was it twenty eight C? It was something like whatever that. it was. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and look, there's, there's even links back to the mafia and Griffith and all sorts of stuff allegedly around <laughs> some of the people that invested in things that did some things that helped launder money. Um, the the challenge here, Rob, is that that yeah, just quickly back from Netflix's perspective, Australia's not a big market to them. And if, I'm not saying you are, I'm not saying that the, the restrictions are or could be, if they were restrictive, too restrictive, then it's easy for Netflix to go, we're done, thanks, see you, have a great day. No one's talking about restrictive uh, And I hear that, content. however, quotas. the free-to-air networks view these quotas as, mm, ask them on a good day, reasonably restrictive, they have to meet this onerous... It is restrictive, and considering drama is not rating anymore. Um, yeah, and, yeah and, but you that's, know, that's of their own There's, there's a they much cannot... bigger... I don't. Well, I, I if think they there's made a bigger better question drama, here. people would watch it. Hello, absolutely. If they made better That's drama why and they cared for it better, Netflix. maybe. Yeah, look, I, I get that. I get that. But at the moment, Australian drama is not working in this country. American drama is not working in this country. No drama That's is working because we in this country it because all. the networks have made it like that. <laughs> No, but they just keep offering a shit, and I don't, you know, like I'm, I'd, I have better things to do with my time than sit down and watch half-assed television. Well, you can tell we have been chomping at the bit to give our views. It's <laughs> going to be a long episode tonight, I think. Long but we've got one more hot news topic before we move on. And it's been something we've speculated about here at TV Black Box, but now the Australian says My Kitchen Rules will be moved away from directly competing with Nine's Juggernaut, Married at First Sight, next year. Production of the series has apparently been pushed back until November, and considering it takes six months to complete work on a series... That would definitely rule out a Q1 launch. Additionally, Ricky Proust has stepped down as executive producer, which will most likely see significant changes next year. TV Tonight reported at the time Proust had been with the network for a decade, eventually becoming Seven's studio head of unscripted TV, and he's credited with the huge success of My Kitchen Rules and House Rules. Sarah, it's certainly a risky move for Seven, considering they know they can still get seven to 800000 up against Married, something new could rate significantly lower. It could rate significantly lower, or they could offer us decent television and maybe it will rate higher. <laughs> yes, but that's the magic, isn't it? Who's coming up with all this brilliant television? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it could be interesting. Um, I, if that's their one show that's really rating well but someone else is killing it, I mean, you probably have to move it so that people can watch it. Um, the thing will be funny is if the other network goes, oh, you're moving here, and then they also move their show to the same time slot. Yeah, Mark, we, we did talk about the fact that Seven know they can get seven to 800K up against Married, and we talked about whether they should move it, and I couldn't pick it. I could not pick which way they would go, and there was part of me that thought, I might keep my kitchen rules there. Yeah, look, it's... It, I... I personally think that my kitchen rules is outstated to welcome. Like sure, but this seven season, or eight hundred k in that environment up against married is nothing to be sneezed at. No, it's not. But the problem is, it's shit house. Like really, <laughs> when we're settling for seven to eight hundred k as being look, that's good. It's not good, mate. Alternative programming is getting five hundred k. Oh no, I know, and that's that's even worse. That's mm -hmm. the problem. And we're about we'll, we'll talk later about what's coming in Q two and what we can expect from that. And holy shit, man, if it's doing the numbers we're seeing now, the, the arguments about broadcast television not holding water, it, uh, that paper boat is emptying itself quickly. Um, 
we're in a position where Married at First Sight next year is going to go one of two ways. It is it will not, I can promise you, it will not be mediocre. It will be mind-blowingly, phenomenally weird and good and, like, you can't not turn away from the car accident or it will be horrific and crash and burn. I don't think there's going to be a middle ground for that. So, yes, you could run Merit at First Sight up against that and do whatever, and that's fine. But, again, how do you how do you sell ads for a show that's doing 800K when that show used to do 1.2, 1.5, 1.6? And yet Married is now doing that, but it, it compromises its ability to draw advertisers because of the nature of the content. You know, you're not going to get Disney advertising on Nine during Married at First Sight, um, except maybe to tell the parents that's what your kids should be watching now. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a horrible situation. Moving Mar- uh, My Kitchen Rules is not a bad idea, but just focus on the cooking again. Kill the relationship stuff. Kill the bitchiness at the instant restaurants. Focus on the drama in the kitchens. Yeah, but the bitchiness is what's making Married at First Sight right. Yeah, but then when they tried it on My Kitchen Rules, everyone went, what is this shit? Even the surprise relationship beat up that they tried fell on its ass in My Kitchen Rules. They were desperate, mate. They absolutely now, they, were, but it didn't work. they... If they move to another night, say they're getting 800 now against a juggernaut show, if they move to a different night, can they get It's not a different a night, viewers? it's a different point in the um, survey year. So instead of uh, launching at the beginning of ratings, they might launch in winter or something or in the back half of the year. And what will be interesting is how this MKR 10th season, which is now sort of a spin-off, goes, Malk. Well, the 10th season is about to end and, yeah, whatever this special anniversary thing is that they were going to run that's now not My Kitchen Rules, that's like Colin Fastenage's Gordon Ramsay, you know, will swear a lot and save your kitchen, whatever thing. Who knows? Like, I, I just, I'm still not convinced that that's the I, right I way to go. I have a feeling they're going to see how that goes and if it, if it goes gangbusters, that will be My Kitchen Rules next year. Look, very likely. It just, it dies a, an ignominious end. Mm. All right, well, now it's time for Hatches and Dispatches with Sarah. Thanks, Rob. 23 journalists and 13 media organisations have faced court over alleged breaches of suppression orders over the trial of Cardinal Pell. But lawyers acting for the defence have asked for more details about the allegations, much to the frustration of Prosecutor Stephen O'Mara. The case will continue on June 26th. The Screen Diversity and Inclusion Network has announced its new co-chairs, Tracy Vieira is the CEO of Screen Queensland and Tim Supomasani is the former Race Discrimination Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. <laughs> DNA tests will determine the legitimacy of Simon Russell's claim to be the long-lost son of the late Reg Grundy. Once legal hurdles have been overcome to release the findings of the tests, Russell will then turn his attention to Grundy's $800 million fortune, according to the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> Channel 9's Love Island is reportedly looking for a new home after it reports Fiji's government is concerned about the sleazy tone of the show. <laughs> the Sunday Telegraph says Queensland is likely to be <laughs> The Sunday Telegraph says Queensland is likely to be the setting of the new series, which will screen on Nine's main channel this year. And that is the latest Hatches and Dispatches. Rob? Thank you very much, Sarah. Coming up on TV Black Box, we'll take a look at how the networks performed over Easter, but more importantly, what will their schedules look like for Q2? And we'll share our Easter TV viewing. TV Black Box will be right back. These are real confessions. Saying I'd wanted to kill my mother since I was eight years old. From real serial killers. Oh, you've got to be violent to them. Best-selling true crime author Amanda Howlett doesn't just talk about their crimes. She talks directly to them. It's all getting a bit much, really. It's the podcast that goes where others fear to tread. Monsters Who Murder. Serial Killer Confessions. Subscribe now in your favourite podcast feed. Okay, now... Now it's time for the programming wrap with the mulkiest mulk of them all, Steve Mulk. Friends, let's stop for a moment and breathe deeply. Close your eyes and remember back to the distant past of two weeks ago. Weeks eight and nine were a boon for nine, thanks to the final weekend finale of Married at First Sight. As expected, it won everything, everything. Uh, it, it was up against on air. And in the finale week, 
it was on only twice and helped Nine to the weekly win despite the AFL leading hard for seven. Nine's relationship reality monster landed squarely in football grand final territory for the finale with 1.9681.968 million wow. viewers, Five City Metro, plus an additional 643k regionally to give the finale an average of 2.611 million viewers. That's the biggest the show has ever been and establishes it as what I expect will be the non-sporting standard bearer for 2019. But it hasn't all been one-way traffic for Mark's mob, as we talked about earlier. The AFL footy show is getting smashed by Sevens the front bar and it appears they don't have any answers there. Also, Bad Mothers lost more than, get this, 1.3 million viewers. They lost... Five City Metro, after the MAFS finale, for its finale, proving we didn't need an Australian version of Big Little Lies or Desperate Housewives. We just need good Aussie drama, and this wasn't it. That same week, as we said, as the MAFS finale, the Today Show was beaten by ABC Breakfast on the Thursday, 181 to 178, Five City Metro. Nine's Brecky Show did bounce back a little, thanks to Easter holidays and the Notre Dame fire, though it's remained pretty solidly in the 170s to 190s and well off the pace Sunriser setting. Nine have reminded us that their Q2 is looming large and while total people wins are nice, that's not what they play for, preferring the key demos as their battleground and where they are landing pretty nicely, thank you very much. They've certainly enjoyed a quieter Easter ratings break. Anyway. For seven, My Kitchen Rules has continued to limp along in the mid-800s even after my uh, Married at First Sight finished up. Viewers just aren't buying what they're selling, and in a first for seven, they've persevered with their once flagship series to burn it off over Easter so they can run its finale, get this, after the House Rules Season 7 premiere, the same night. Wow. Remember the last time that anyone did something like that? Yep. Yeah. It was 10 in 2011 with their tragic comedy of the MasterChef Australia finale overlapping an episode of the then flagging Renovators. And that didn't go down well from memory. No, it, uh, it, remember they had the finale, they went to Renovators, mm. came back and there was the live winner announced bit. Yes. Perhaps the audience will be kinder this time. <coughs> it won't be because Lego Masters... <coughs> Their flagship public affairs program, having been re rebranded as Sunday Night True Stories, is sinking quickly. In a two-horse race where your competition is 60 minutes and you're seen as the tabloid show, time to address <laughs> the big red train-sized elephant in the room. There's some commentary for you. And if it wasn't for the AFL and their 6pm news, Seven would be barely rating a mention. How do we help this mob team? Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, Seven have not been so exposed when shows haven't worked because they've got strong multi-channels and they've mm. worked hard to build those up. And yes. they've obviously got strong investment in sport, which helps yes. them. And also their strong news, which is usually the number one show of the night. When there's no big tentpole show like Married at First Sight, Seven News is the number one program of the night. And that is hiding some of the issues within Seven. Home and Away has bounced back a little bit, but it's still not competitive with the current affair at 7 o'clock. Current affairs hitting it out of the ballpark. You know, like, full credit to a current affair. The project gets all the publicity, gets all the column inches, mm -hmm. but it's a current affair doubling the audience of the project every night. But I put to you, it's also playing to a really specific demo, which is not Nine's key demos. Well, this is the problem with television. You know, when I was doing Studio 10, at one point I got told... Rob, your demos are too old. You, you know, like you, you, you've got an older audience, not the 25 to 54. And I said, yes, but if I alienate those older audience, I'll have no one because yep. they're the people watching TV at that time of morning and, and yeah. they're the ones who are buying the advertorial products because younger people see something they like and they just go searching for it online. I was very specifically, I'll tell you, as a program maker, I was very specifically playing to an older audience. I was trying to be aspirational, thinking young, but yes. also being aware that I was tailoring to an older audience as well. 
Um, there was it a lot of thought that went into that. It would be to think otherwise. Morning television is the home Absolutely. of the retiree. But but why shouldn't and Current Affair mum. do that? You know, like it is Australia's number one 7 p.m. program. And I'm not saying to not, but it's not hitting their key demos that they like to trumpet. That like it is, but it's not. That's not the key demo that they win. Isn't their key demos? No, and if you look at um, Fridays, because they know there's only older viewers home on Fridays, there'll usually be a pensioner story on Friday because the younger demos are all out and they're trying to make sure they still get yep. the numbers. Um, that's been the way for a long time now. I mean, I just I think back to when Seven had really good comedies on, um, like sitcoms and stuff, and mm. it seems like they don't really have that anymore. Like bring Seven back were the home of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, they were. Like, I mean, pretty much everything Gary Riley made that rated well was on Seven. Mm. Um, and it, I just wonder, like, is it just people aren't watching TV anymore because they can just get it online? Or is it just that they're not getting what they want to see and that's why they're going to, you know, Netflix and things like that? It's a really good question because there's an argument whether those shows hold up when you watch them now. You know, like I saw an episode of Fast Forward and I was a bit shocked at how it didn't hold up, you know, and it was one of my favourite shows back in the day, but it didn't hold up watching it years later. But maybe that's what topical comedy is about. It doesn't hold up. But there is a question, would a show like Fast Forward fly now? So, would a- like, and Kath and Kim is on Netflix. I, I just found it on Netflix in the US. Yes. and um I my friend was visiting for my birthday and so I turned it on and we watched the very first episode because I had missed all of Kath and Kim because mm-hmm. it started after I left but I'd always seen everyone talking about it and everyone always you know joking around with the voices and it's old I mean she's wearing like the g-string le- leotard um, <laughs> but uh, and all of us were like did people really wear that but it does hold up and it's funny and Matt actually when I get home will put it on which is crazy um, but you know, it's it's still funny. So bring that back. Bring stuff back like Let's that. Let's see that some isn't... Aussie comedy return to the screens. Yeah. Well, friends, let's see what we have here. Over on ten, Chris and Julia's Sunday night takeaway finished up what felt to be a bit premature on its first Sunday night of the non ratings period, with its second worst result of the run, a meager two hundred and fifty four thousand five city metro the week before was 161, and that was its lowest. Shocking. Dancing with the Stars finishes tonight, podcast recording time, and uh, it's one point between Courtney Act and Sam Johnson, um, to give you a hint of where we're up to, Uh, and it will round out a mediocre run that has nothing to do with the content they delivered. The show has been great. Substituting Denise Scott, even, for Grant Daniel while he was in hospital, and last week's semi delivering 543 for the show, 556 thousand five city metro for the elimination making it the second highest rating ep of the season so tonight should do fine colin vickery the herald sun writer asked on twitter do you think uh dancing with the stars will be back next year and i think it's a no-brainer i think that's a yes from 10 it's the only thing in q1 new that's come along that has actually worked for them everything else has been everything else that they've thrown at the wall has been a write-off this will definitely be back if Chris and Julia come back with Sunday Night Takeaway, you know the network has no ideas left because there's no way it can come back for the kind of budget it would be on with those kind of numbers. It's dead and buried. Well, when Julia Morris signed off, she didn't say, we'll see what happens. To her great credit, she did say, that's the end of this season. We look forward to seeing you next year. Right. No guarantees, no promises, but, yeah. you know, let's be buoyant and this is where we're headed. Mm. Screeching in off the back of the Merit at First Sight finale... This well-hyped second season of Bachelor in Paradise hasn't lit any fires, even with a well-hyped showdown between former Bachelor Richie and his chosen girlfriend, Alex, that spoke volumes, if you read between the lines, though it amounted to not much. There's, a, there's lots going on in Paradise, but it can't raise an audience above 560k, acknowledging the bulk of it has aired in Eastern non-ratings, or was that their ploy all along? They must have been hoping for a boost from the MasterChef bubble as they slide it back to run it out behind the first week of their last great rating saviour. And it's worth noting, Mulk, even with those ratings, it's still coming fourth in its slot. 560k, anything sub 600 is not great. No. Anything. The 10 brand continues to stink and has the very real potential to do greater harm than good. Sarah, Rob, is it possible to salvage any hope from this rolling dumpster fire? I think it's all going to come down to how MasterChef does. 
if master chef look presumably should do okay but what are we looking at seven eight hundred thousand if we're lucky mate if what we were talking for seven seven eight hundred thousand is respectable uh, look 10 will be over the moon Would if it does seven hundred seven hundred eight hundred thousand but if it if it comes in at five to six hundred thousand what does that mean i mean it's 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 over a decade old it's um season 11 coming season 11 it's um uh, there doesn't seem to besides all the 10 promos there hasn't been a lot of noise about it in the press um i i don't know i'm not feeling particularly optimistic i'm not feeling particularly optimistic for 10 that this is going to be their savior and if masterchef doesn't work and they still end up fourth behind the abc when masterchef launches they're done and dusted for the year poor I quickly want to mention Foxtel because the final season of the biggest show on TV kicked off last week on Fox Showcase and did insane non-sport numbers for Foxtel. Noting that there's no Five City Metro Regional for the subscription TV provider, it's only national figures, the first episode did nearly 962,000 nationally on the first day, plus an additional 333,000 streamed live or on demand via Foxtel Now and Foxtel Go. As the series finale creeps closer, those numbers are only going to get bigger too. Are you guys Game of Thrones fans? Any thoughts on last week's ep or this week's ep with no spoilers, of course? Uh, we, we, I was up very late last night. Um, yes. Because, you know, it's six something. Oh, no, it's 7.20 in the morning here now. Um, but uh, Game of Thrones was on at nine o'clock last night. Yes. So we were up watching that. Um, and uh, it's funny because I had a whole bunch of people on my Facebook feed who were all like, I've never seen a single episode of like Ugh. Game of Thrones. Ugh. I'm so much superior to you. And <laughs> I'm like... You people are missing out. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, that's it. Because and the and I saw one person put it really well because I didn't watch it for a long time because Matt likes to binge watch an entire show, um, yep. and so we thought that they were kind of done and our friends assured us that it was done. So we watched it all and then they're like, "And there's another season and it won't be for a year and a half." <laughs> and Matt was like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So we're very happy it's back, but um, the people who take this superiority thing of not watching it, I'm like, dude, you're just missing out on actual interesting water cooler talk. Yeah, and we yeah. talked about great TV. Game of Thrones, Thrones is great TV. The numbers from Foxtel, it's it's not comparing apples with apples, you know, we we because that number, the 962 or whatever yeah, it was, yeah. is from an 11 o'clock airing, a 12 o'clock, a one, two, three, four, five, you know. Three like they, airings on day one. Yeah. They, they no, they ran it more than three times. The three times were just what made the top 20. So there were more airings is my understanding. Sure. Even still, people tune in to watch it, even if it's the same uh, It's a great result. It's just not comparing to the same kind of way we look at a traditional broadcast model where you have to watch it at 7.30 for it to be counted in in the overnight ratings. You're, you're right. They're taking a national figure and multiple airings of the one product, even but if it's, it's only three times. But it's also subscription television, right? It, they're, yeah. they're, what, 15, 20% uh, of the market? And by the way, I don't want to shit can on the result because I think it's yeah, a yeah. phenomenal result. And I may, may you know, like... And and Foxtel deserve all the credit for having an output deal with HBO. <laughs> you know, nice. like it's that, that's uh, worth that's worth Rupert selling off another grandchild. You know, like it's it's a great <laughs> output deal. It's um it's it's coming to fruition. What was interesting uh, in week one was that the UK post show, which was I can't remember the name of it. Thrones um, 360? Uh, no, that's the local production. Oh, that's the Aussie one, sorry. Which did not make the top 20, but the UK one that they ran did. So I don't know what the numbers were for the 360, but... But that's it, an untested... You know, like that's a tough... They be they were running into the series, but James Matheson and Steph Bendixson and that show were new this season. Yeah. Like if you want it... They, and they've been running the UK catch-up, um, Game of Thrones catch-up recap show... For two or three seasons. So right. So I haven't been be across that. that, but I just noticed that in the rankings and I wondered why that is. And and you're right. It is hard to come into the last season when you haven't built up an audience and a following. Um, a show like that would have been great if it had launched its Series 1 or yeah. even Series 2 once you knew what kind of But how would you have known, right? No, absolutely. 
it's like Talking Bad. Talking Bad spun off a whole bunch of mm. copycats and even of itself mm. um, that became Talking Dead and the rest of it. But yep. because of its popularity behind Breaking Bad and then what Breaking Bad became, Talking Bad became the must-watch companion yes. show to Breaking Bad. Now, friends, if you thought that was it, one, I haven't done my sign-off. Two, we have quarter two to talk about. So I'm going to have to absolutely race through this. I just want to land on the main shows for everyone that has stuff coming through in quarter two. And while we've been talking, I've had to update this list. So get ready. A quick mention of Netflix and Stan. They have new shows dropping all the time. And Amazon Prime has new shows a little less frequently. Highlights include Good Omens coming soon to Prime, Perpetual Grace Limited and George Clooney's Catch-22 coming to Stan next month and three to new five shows a week on Netflix, including the highly anticipated season three of Stranger Things in early July. And also Cobra Kai season two has landed on YouTube Premium and I've already smashed it and it's bloody great. Oh my God, I love that series way too much. As we just talked about, Game of Thrones is dominating. Uh, Game of Thrones is dominating Foxtel's programming and cross and its cross promotional life right now, and not unreasonably so. They have announced Big Little Lies season two will follow straight out of Game of Thrones in that 11 a.m. simulcast time slot, with a Monday night primetime repeat. Foxtel have lots of Aussie drama coming in 2019, including season seven of Wentworth, which I think is about a June, July launch, and their new series, Lambs of God, which is getting good festival buzz overseas, but nothing is scheduled yet. Auntie are continuing to deliver quality content across the year with the recording studio, the best thing on Tuesday nights right now, and Killing Eve getting fast-tracked to iview on Saturdays with a following Friday broadcast repeat. And that's why they bumped the heights, which was phenomenal as well. More of that to come about June. ABC's Monday night lineup of Australian Story, Four Corners and Media Watch and Q&A remains one of the most consistent in the business and draws audiences across the year accordingly. Arn's Brush with Fame season four, The Weekly with Charlie Pickering season five, and You Can't Ask That season four are all performing well on Wednesday nights. And Harrow season two is not far away, coming to Sunday's starting election week. Mm -mm -mm. When we look at SBS, Who Do You Think You Are, Australia season 10, the 64th Eurovision Song Contest, The Handmaid's Tale season three, all of that plus CBS All Access as The Good Fight Season 3, airing right now on SBS, delivers some of the most amazing TV going around. Given Game of Thrones is the biggest TV at the moment, Hulu's The Handmaid's Tale isn't far behind it, and in Australia, it's on a government broadcaster, and that is stunning. Post-Easter is the first big reset for the commercial free-to-air networks. Seven will be glad the AFL hits its mid-season straps. And as I said before, we get some of House Rules Season 7 and its necessary buoyancy beaming into our homes post-haste. They're currently burning the new US drama The Passage off late nights on Mondays and about to give us the ITV Broadchurch-esque series The Bay very soon. Landing early, as in tomorrow night, the also rebranded Andrew Denton interview starts uh, and we're getting season two just as the co-branded podcast lands with the extended and retold stories from season one which is quite frankly competition and i think denton should just stay in television uh, for fans of the amazing race season 31 starts also on tuesdays this week on seven flicks um, all of the other cards are too close to seven's programming chest to know anything nine however have been a little bit more forthcoming the Hamish Blake hosted Lego Masters drops this Sunday and runs initially three times a week and the hotly followed The Voice Australia season eight and will fit in somewhere. And then following into that is season six of the fabulous Talking About Your Generation. I've seen the first two eps of TAG and the first ep of Lego Masters and they are both outrageously fun TV. I loved Lego Masters. Yes. I'm not sure it's going to go gangbusters though. They've only given us one ep, is the tough thing. Mm. And look, we got a lot of building in that 90 minutes without ads. I, I loved it. And I, we, I, the kids, the family watched it and we really, it was enthralling. I, it's just not a married at first sight as far as numbers go. That's my Yeah, but also it's, I, I think up against everything else where it's all basically feel-good TV and we've just had the rancid stuff of Merit at First Sight, that's a great point of difference. I, I just agree. And change. I actually think it will do well. It's just not going to be the gangbuster... Stop the Nation program. 
it, it it's outrageously fun TV. I don't think it'll pull 1.9 million for its finale. That's all I'm saying. But I think it'll do good business. Mm. 20 to 1 swings back into Monday nights from next week with returning host Aaron Mole, and they're having another go at this, and new addition comedian slash Triple M Brisbane host Nick Cody landing next to her. Uh, I think that Doctor Doctor Season 4 should land somewhere in this next quarter as well or some other drama. And don't forget the 61st Logie Awards at the end of June, live from the Gold Coast. And we will also say farewell to the Big Bang Theory in its 12th and final season this quarter as well. So 9 have got some big stuff lining up. As for 10, well, so, so much hope goes here. We will finally see MasterChef Australia Season 11 once the Eastern on ratings period is over. And if you've been watching Batchy on a Beach with all the ads they've been running, you've been forgiven for thinking that you've already seen it. <laughs> Programming all year, eh? Uh, have you been paying attention? Season 7 will make its welcome return to, hopefully, Monday nights and run the rest of the year. And the new Adam Zwar written Stephen Curry-fronted dramedy Mr. Black also lands in the midst of that somewhere. The ads look super great, so I'm super hopeful. And, breaking news, in a promo tonight on 10 during Dancing with the Stars, they announced that Five Bedrooms is rushing to our screens. Oh. So the new Cat Stewart um, uh, guy from um, Pack to the Rafters, what's his name, the young bloke? I, I can't remember, but I'm, I did not think that would be ready to go. No, neither did I, but they basically just said coming soon and not like, like a lining up next to Mr. Black and all of the other shows that are coming soon. They've basically inferred that that, uh, Five Bedrooms is rushing to our screens. Wow. Okay. Um, Also, we could see the first full series of Kinney Tonight or Trial by Kyle in quarter two. Now, these are the two of the pilot shows that they picked up from last year. The former, Kinney Tonight, has wrapped and is in post. And the latter, Trial by Kyle, will be lucky to get to post, given the star has missed, at last count, two full days of filming. (gasps) Two full days. I knew one. He's yeah, missed the, the, two. The word that I picked up across the socials was that he also then didn't do a second one because he wasn't feeling it. <laughs> Quarter two <laughs> is going to be massive. There is no question, but that is the programming wrap. All right, before we get this extravaganza of a podcast finished, thank you, Mog, for that. Let's find out what everyone's been watching. Sarah, what have you been watching? Okay, so uh, Netflix has uh, uh, just a massive amount of Australian programming right now, and I guess I'm a little homesick because um, I am watching all of it. Um, so mm-hmm. we've been watching Kath and Kim, which is uh, yes. the my American friends are actually enjoying, and it's, hold, it's held up well over time, and it's hilarious. Um, yes. And then I saw there was another show about, like, the beginnings of Australia um, that was a whole series, and I just watched the first episode, and it was like – talking about like when Australia was founded, but then it was interspersed with all of these Australian celebrities. And so that was interesting. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember Is that this on one? Netflix? Yeah. Um, yeah, I know the one you're talking about. It was on like on TV I think it was like Australia, Australia like the two beginning. Years ago. Or something, something like that. Something like that, yeah. 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 And, then, and then there was Chris Lilly's new show. Um, ah. This is Lunatics. Yeah. Uh, so what I watched think? that specifically for this podcast. Um, yes, because I, we were going to do a big review of Chris Lee, but we've run out of time. And then my, I forced my husband to watch it because I'm like, hang on, I just need to watch this real quick uh, before Game of Thrones. And thank God Game of Thrones started. And I was like, you know what, we're done with this shit. Because it was honestly... I I have no fucking clue what Chris Lee was trying to achieve with this show. Um, it, I lasted it, less than 10 minutes, Sarah. I feel dumber for having watched it. Uh, Matt looked at me and said, your friends at Black Box are never allowed to ask you to watch this again because it was <laughs> honestly the oh, worst God. thing that we've ever seen. Um, and like well, I the, can give you worse, but okay. No, but like I, I get that there was all the controversy surrounding it, like was he doing blackface, which he, uh, he wasn't. Um, but I still don't get, like it's like he wants to be Adam Sandler or Eddie Murphy and do like all of the characters in a show. Yeah. Um, now, Mark. Monk did a review of this and he panned it big time. But, Monk, you said you used to like Chris Lilly and Summer High Tide. See, I've never been a fan. I've never liked any of those shows where he does the multi-characters. I don't get it. I don't find it funny of seeing him trying to be a 14-year-old girl or whatever. But you, you've you liked his work, but this one turned you off. And, and look, I, I was pondering in, in when I wrote the review, was it because it was of the time? Was it... 
Because let, let, let's remember, right? The complaints about Chris Lilly doing blackface with Jonah and Tonga or Smouse, uh, S Mouse that he did in Angry Boys. Um, he did Jonah in in Summer Heights High, mm. along with Jamae, along with Mr. G and, and a couple of others. Um, so it's not... <sighs> It's not anything that was kind of out of the ballpark, but I think that Chris Lilly, when he was, and I say this unfortunately, when he was at his best, he was reflecting some of broadly who we are as society to us and finding that comedy in all of that. Now, some people have argued with me and said that, no, no, his comedy's always been punching down and that in comedy terms, that's very easy and not what you want to do. You want to punch up because you, you want to fight the people that are above you, not the people who are below you um, or, you know, in a, in a lesser position. The, the challenge around lunatics is I really wanted to like it. And you're right, Sarah, it's the, the blackface thing, even though some people are sort of still insisting that it's a blackface character, Yana, the lesbian pet psychic from South Africa. It's not a thing. Um, it, all, all it did was reveal six horrific people and their foibles and their, their character flaws and all of the rest of it. And didn't all it basically said was, you know, if you're a lunatic, you do you. And that's not. Yeah, like That's none not of them a good have enough redeeming qualities. For ten episodes of horror. Like you look at Michael from The Office, and he's a he's yeah, yeah. a fuck up. Like he is a, but he has redeeming qualities. Sure. And none of these characters had that. Yes. Like I just didn't and, get the but, point. But they tried to spin it that they did was the problem. The writing tried to spin it that they did. Uh, you can read my review on TVBlackbox.com that I uh, used. I really a fascinating wanted, review. Fascinating. really wanted to like Lunatics, and it just did not land. Mm. Yeah, but what else no. have you been watching, Mark? Uh, look, uh, The Good Fight, um, season three is on SBS right now on Wednesday nights, and it is some of the finest American drama I think I've seen in a long, long time. It's quirky, it's funny, it's everything that The Good Wife was, then sort of wrapped up and, and distilled and made better somehow. Um, loving The Good Fight. Um, past seasons are on 10 All Access if you want to pay 10 bucks a month. Um, and if uh, you're going to do that, click through the TV Black Box website. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have ads that give us a little bit of coin for you signing up. So how about it? Um, Billions on Stan is big on my radar still. So is John Oliver. I'm desperately keen to see some of this new stuff that we just talked about. Um, like I said, I watched the first two episodes of the new season of Tag. I will watch Sean McAuliffe read the phone book. That guy is brilliant. <laughs> and he is fabulous as the host of Tag. It's almost like it's the show he was born to host. And he's he's just he's amazing. He is amazing. Well, I this is going to shock you. I've been watching that 70s show. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> I'm on season seven now, so I've only got two more. Like, I'm, I'm only a few episodes into season seven, so I've got this season and season eight to go, and we're done. You'll never hear me speak of it again. Uh, Rubbish. I've been watching Big Bang Theory, Game of Thrones, and Modern Family. Um, of course, Game of Thrones, yes. Yes. The OA, which was a brilliant mm. season and has taken that storyline in a whole new direction. But I stumbled across a show on Netflix called Special, which is really, really interesting. It's about this character with cerebral palsy. And it's the episodes are actually only about 15 minutes long. So they're really yeah, yeah. easily digestible. But they actually do so much with that 15, 16 minutes. It's eight episodes. My wife and I actually, we watched the whole series in one day. And... It goes in places you don't expect it to go, and it's really funny. And I would say go and take a look. It's called Special. It's on Netflix. Do yourself a favour, as Molly would say. Oh, gosh. Mm. And meanwhile, that's the TV Black Box. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sarah. (laughs) 